back to day two or at the Highland Games Saturday. I hope you're having a great and wonderful day in Middle Earth. Uh, I've got some cool stuff. I want to split it up into different videos so they're not quite super long. We had a nice sermon we were just at. In fact, I actually knew the preacher, someone from where I'm at. So anyway, yeah, it's pretty fun. So it's a great day. I'll get you some good footage and pictures. All right. Welcome to another video. Future editing Zolin in the future of the video here. Real fast, insert myself for a little bit of information. I'm going to put together both the two different videos of both Saturday and Sunday. This will be in both videos, so whichever you're watching, welcome, welcome. Don't forget to like and subscribe, my friends. This is kind of a blog series. I put a lot into these videos. I have some timestamps I'll put in there that you can kind of hop around because I understand, unless you're someone who wants to see all of it. Wonderful. We drove out to this uh, event, the Seaside Highland Games. It's uh, quite a drive, but you know what? It's super fun to go to in Southern California and we have a blast and a lot of people come from all over the world and some people come from Scotland and it's pretty darn awesome and a couple other places so again um, I also have a couple things in both of these videos one is with the Celtic caterer um, and he is awesome and again I will link his stuff in the description of these videos okay and also another couple people I met at uh, the selling locations there and the cool things they made and again I'll link their stuff in the future there uh, down in the description as well for you guys to check it it out it's super super cool so anyway i hope you enjoyed the video and that's all the info i wanted to give for you guys enjoy enjoy my friends all right here comes the bands <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. That's why I have that a little bit.
right, guys. So this is uh, this is one of the singers from Highland Way, and he's a uh, Lord of the Rings fan. So tell us, who's your favorite character? Oh, it's got to be Legolas because of his hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he definitely is. It's funny because I see Orlando Bloom's without long hair now, and I'm like, no, he's got to have long hair. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, they're an awesome group, and you got to check them out, and I'm going to link them in the description, too. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much yeah, for a little bit. We appreciate it. Cool. <laughs> awesome. I was yeah, telling them my mom would, wouldn't give me her old CDs when I was <laughs> 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 and I was Yeah. <laughs> I know, you guys, we love your music. It's awesome. This is, you can get their stuff oh, online. Yeah. You guys sell it online. <laughs> you sell it online too, right? Okay, because I, I do a YouTube channel and I was going to do a little review of the Highland Games today, so I'll tell people. I'll link it. I'll find it and link it on my video. <laughs> there might be something on here. Oh, perfect. There might be something oh, all right, sweet, right there. All right, I'll, I'll link it too. Okay. Hi. Oh yeah. W W. Okay. Highland Way. All right. Cool. I'll, I'll take one. Is this perfect? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan's been a big fan for a long time. <laughs> I've always liked your guys' music. Oh yeah. It's nice to have this kind of music because I feel like we don't get it enough. You know. <laughs> yeah, oh that would be so fun. Yeah, so yeah. Oh my, yeah. So oh my gosh. All right, guys. For this next part of the video, let me show you a couple cool visual shots here. I got some of the uh, the cool banner they make. We got a couple here of the shops and some of the cool accessories and things they're selling. And then we have a couple great shots of the bands. I hope you enjoyed the bands and the walk down. It was really fun. I also had fun meeting, uh, we've talked to them a lot, but the Highland Way, uh, their singing group. I highly recommend you check them out. Uh, link to some in the description like you just saw. And also, the next part of the video right here, we are going to have another one of uh, the Celtic caterer, um, Eric McBride's wonderful here, is going to have the show of his food and it's really really awesome he has does history and of course i also had another one of his uh presentations in the previous video if you watched the first day this is technically sunday uh this day there and i realized it sounded like i said saturday at the beginning of this video but i was talking about the previous day i just my words were a little fast there anyway i hope you enjoy again check out all their stuff in the description don't forget to like, subscribe, and enjoy the rest of the video. We have a little bit more fun stuff for you guys to watch in this video. Thank you so much for joining us today. And also, guys, a little bit of context for this next part we're going to watch is I, at the beginning, I didn't put the entire sermon because that's really long, but I clipped a couple neat spots with some of the music, and also they had a neat moment where they had some of the people come up and say what clans they were a part of and things like that. And I have a cool background of my family. But anyway, I put a couple neat little clips from that as well. And then um, that will be right after the cooking show that is appearing here after right after this moment. All right, enjoy. This commence with a six out beneath Wales. That's Cornwall. Even though Cornwall was to be part of England, they want to tell you that they are not English. Because of so many places in Cornwall still do not have electricity running water, let alone Wi-Fi, the internet. Here it is, 2023. And I've been saying that for over 10 years. <laughs> now, the really has are closely related to the people who cross the English Channel of the Britons, but just don't tell them that. Now, the Britons <laughs> are in that northwestern corner of France that sticks out into the Atlantic. They're the last of the old Gauls, the people used to fight against um, the Romans and all of them. And they will tell you that the rest of the French are nothing but Germans, and technically they're right. <laughs> now, the last two everybody always forgets about is Galicia and Asturias, Spain. Galicia is the northwestern corner of Spain, right above Portugal. Story is immediately to the east along the northern coastline. Now, centuries ago, when the English were in their boardrooms in London, renaming everything around the world and calling it Celtic and not Celtic, they said, Well, here's Galicia and here's Sturia. They're right next to each other, so we'll just lump them together and make one big Celtic nation. Which is why many times on the internet you'll see it as listed as seven Celtic nations. In fact, there's a band named after that. <coughs> if they ever even bothered to go there, they would know there's a huge mountain chain that separates them. The only way you can get from one to the other in those days was by sea. Now, why is Galicia and Asturias being important to all Celts all around the world? Well, if we go back to Ireland, and you look in the Book of Kells and the Book of Invasions, it talks about the different people who came to Ireland. The last group of people who came to Ireland were the Celts themselves. Known as the Sons of Melnius, they sailed out of what is, the world of Spain, 
and landed in Cork, Ireland, somewhere between the 5th and 7th century BC. Over the centuries, those people went further up in Ireland, and the 2nd and 3rd century of the current era, some of them sailed across the Irish Sea, and those people became the Welsh. Others went further up in Ireland, and in 534, the kingdom of Dalriatta split apart, led by a man named Fergus McGurk, who sailed across to what is now Argyll, Scotland, and founded the kingdom of Dalriatta. Dariada is the first time the tribe of Scots ever come to Scotland. Now there were already Celts living in Scotland at the time. So those were the ones that the Romans called the Picts. They themselves called themselves Albanax and called their country Alba. And their trace their lineage goes differently down through Belgium. Ultimately where all Celts come from is in Elstadt, Austria between 1500 and 1700 BC. So knowing where people come from is how cuisine develops. If people move in the area, they find what flora and fauna is around, what they can hunt, what they can fish in the rivers and streams and oceans. And over time, those favorites, uh, family favorites become a village favorite become the cuisine. Now, as I said at the beginning, Celtic cuisine doesn't fit in a nice little parameter. But compared to a couple of the others, it kind of still does. Because normally when you think German cuisine, it's just German. We talk about Mexican cuisine, right? Most people know about Mexican cuisine, but you know where they think there's a big difference between Chihuahua in the north, Guadalajara in the south, and Baja west. Okay, you don't even use the same ingredients. You still lump it all together as Mexican cuisine. Italian cuisine, very popular around the whole world. But there's a big difference between Etruscan, Naples, Sicily isn't even part of Italy. If you still label it, it's Italian cuisine. Celtic cuisine is divided between those eight Celtic nations, five political nations, and 12 languages. The difference is 3,500 years of intercultural chain of trade that binds them together. Myself as a historical chef, I take a step back and kind of connect all the dots. So we're going to be doing one today, and this one is from Brittany, France. This is out of my baking Celtic cookbook. And this is a pumpkin soup with bacon bits of blue cheese crumbles. It is so perfect for this time of the year. You're going to be finding out so many different things right now. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start off with bacon. Now, in the book, I will tell you that there's lots of different types of bacon. How many people have been over to you in Scotland or Ireland or whatever, and they ordered breakfast and you said, why is there ham on my plate instead of the bacon you probably It is bacon. The bacon can be anything from the pork loin, the meat over the ribs, and the meat of the pork belt. Their butchers do two types of bacon. They do one that's half of the pork loin and most of the rib. That's called the wraps of the bacon. That's what you were getting at breakfast. The other one is called a streaky bacon, and it's just the tail end of the rib meat in all of the pork belly. So you only get two types of bacon out of it. Over here, our chef, our butchers go and decide, no, they need to make more money off of it. So they have one cut for the pork loin, one cut for the rib, and one cut for the pork belly. So really, the only bacon we get is Canadian bacon, which is the pork loin and the pork belly that we go and uh, a lot of good uh, vinegar brine, they smoke it and salt it a little differently. That's why it tastes a lot different. And it yields more uh, fat out, you know, just when you go and cook it than it does just cooking the pork belly. All that marination that it does take care of. It. There's one more type of bacon, which is more of the Britain do. It's the one that's across the top, the back bacon. The real back bacon is mostly all fat. It's right above the pork loin. That's the one that the Britons call lard. It's lard, but they don't pronounce the D. If you do a cross grain of it, cut across the grain for it all, then they call it lardon. Most of the languages over there, they change you know, different things when you're changing the, the structure or the meaning of it. So we're going to be using just a fatty type of streaky bacon, but we're going to do a cross cut, and this is a great substitute for lardon. And this is what we're going to do right now. We've got a nice cold bacon here, so it makes it much easier to cut. And we're going to have that cooking on the side for us while we're building up our soup. I'm sorry, I did not have, we're missing one part for my overhead camera set, and I tried to go get some of that stuff, and it doesn't seem anybody anywhere in this area sells just one little piece that connects everything. So I'm going to have to come around and walk around for a thing for a bunch of these guys. These things are so versatile and easy to go for. The fire department loves us for using these things because if the stove falls off the table, it instantly shuts itself off. <laughs> They're cheap. 
they're inexpensive. So, we've got that bacon bake going to go on the side here for us all, and that will take a while to cook up. Place that off to the side right now. We can start off with our pumpkin soup. So, probably you've seen this, and if you've seen any of my demos before, you know I use Kerrygold butter. Not because they pay me to do anything, because they don't pay anybody to do anything, but one day they might. And why I use it is because of different things as a chef we want to use it. First of all, American butter uses between 17 and 19 pints of milk to make a pound of butter. Kerry Gold is using between 21 and 23 pints of milk to make that same pound of butter. But it translates as a cook, it means it has 3% more milk fat, but more importantly, 15% less water than American butter. We water down our butter. How many times you take the butter out of the refrigerator and you put it on the counter and it starts to sweat with water and oil don't want to mix or at all? Now, I it was just some scared. of our chefs, and we do that mainly because our main production for butter is ending right about now. Uh, September, October, that's the big production. Most all of that butter is going into freezer so that we keep the price relatively the same through the winter months. So we got some butter going to be melting here, and then we're going to cook with some leeks. How many people cook with leeks? One, two, three. So here's the thing. A lot of people don't know that this has an onion garlic flavor for it all. And if you go to some of the culinary schools, and I've even seen chefs online, chefs online that will just tell you, just use the white. There isn't a single household in Scotland, in Ireland, Wales, anyone who doesn't use as much of it as possible. And the Welsh, of course, this is their national flower, is the leek. And they put it in everything. But one of the reasons why you gotta watch out for it is this is a soil line, so it gets a lot of dirt and it's hard to clean out. The easiest way to do it is to split it in half, and then you can wash out everything in between. So while our butter is kind of melting here, I'm going to swap up some leeks. Now one of the reasons why they tell you not to use the dark part is because it's a little heavier, it's not as delicate as the flavor, but when you mix it with potatoes, if you're trying to puree anything, it can make it too thick. So like we are going to be putting a little bit of potatoes in our dish today, but we'll just wash it on how much we're going to puree it. Because it can become, like if you're doing a cream potato leek soup, you can almost turn it into blue by having too much of everything. Because we're using, in those cases, we normally use yellow potatoes. Today we are using red potatoes. So it's not in all the starch levels, right? You have to think about really anymore. Cooking is a form of chemistry. I hated chemistry in school. And that's why I became a medical foreman with the Marine Corps. Another form of chemistry, right? <laughs> and now I'm doing it all the time. So I, this is food chemistry, but this is more, for me, artistic outlet, which I enjoy. And then I'm a historian, so of course, everything's got to have a backstory. So we're going to take our onions, just saute that a little bit in the butter, and we're going to add a little bit of onions in there, too. And a little bit of garlic. So pumpkins are huge, any kind of squash is huge up in Brittany, France, the northern part of France. And it's a combination of a lot of different flavors, and the Cornish love pumpkins as well. Now they actually created something called a mixed spice, which we're going to be using today. Cornish mixed spice for a dish. And it's a very intricate um, spice bun, and the recipe I have is over 400 years old. However, you kind of know already the spice. You know the American knockoff version because we'll see a good idea and then we'll try to see how inexpensive we can make it and then go from there. So you all know it as pumpkin spice. <laughs> but Cornish mixed spice makes pumpkin spice change because there's so much more intricate aspect flavor to it all. So we're like I said, we're just dicing up on our, and it doesn't matter how big of your onions for it all because it's all going to be pureed at the end to an extent but it's we want to get the maximum amount of flavor and one of the reasons why you chop up as much right now is, is that we were if we get our butter going it's going to go and help us um, take that onion flavor out that's what the sauteing it all we're trying to spread around the onion flavor to everything we've got here so that's the same. anything you can dice up to make it easier like that will get better flavor for it. And I'm wondering 
seasoning that we have right now, which is available next door with all the rest of my stuff. We're just gonna add this in. So it has a little bit of allspice in here, plus um, cinnamon, uh, nutmeg, mace, which is the outer covering of nutmeg, coriander seeds, ginger, and cloves. Believe me, you put this, if you make your own, like if you have your own espresso machine or so, my roommate uses that all, he and his girlfriend are always using that on their, their espresso for it all. So we want to get this mixed in now before we add in our stock. Now this is a chicken stock that I've used to go and mix with our potatoes that we're putting. Now I already boiled the potatoes down. So that'll save the time. And I boil the potatoes in the same liquid that I put the stock in. See, that's in the cookbook. So you gotta go to the <laughs> Oh yes, always. So, next stage here. We've got our stock, the base of our soup, all our vegetables, the potatoes are in there, the pumpkin is kind of puree through. We've got a couple more stages to go for everything. It sure smells good. <laughs> Add a little bit more of the stock, and now we're putting heavy whipping cream in. Now, here's the thing about dairy products. We've all been taught fat's bad, fat is so bad, fat is from the 1950s on, since Eisenhower was president. There's been this massive campaign about fat bad. Do you know who's been paying for it? Sugar. The sugar companies have been paying for all that publicity for all. I gave up sodas, I lost 38 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still going down for all of it. Bacon fat is not considered the best fat, but dairy fat, avocado fat, you've already heard it. Anybody in California's heard about the avocado fat being good for you. It's helped for your processing in your brain. It also doesn't lead to where we go and put it all. It, it gets more in your system. We have it here, we have our whole milk, we have our 2% or 1% our skim milk. What they're not telling you is that every time you went from whole milk to 2%, they're increasing the sugar level and tripling the estrogen level. So when you go to 1%, it's even more sugar and more estrogen and skim, yeah. It's the only way they can balance it out. Next time you go to the grocery store, look at that. If you don't believe me, look at other things like peanut butter, right? Get a whole regular peanut butter and look at one that says fat free. And look at it, the grams of sugar is a lot higher per serving, which is normally like a tablespoon. Sugar is higher, so they're always, anytime it's fat free or reduced fat, there's more sugar in it, which actually is going to go more right to where your fat is. Now, heavy whipping cream. Now, when I told you that that's our scale, in France, and they start at whole milk and they go the other direction. They don't even mess with it. So they have whole food, uh, whole milk, and then they have what's called single cream, kind of like our table cream, uh, but about three to five percent more milk fat than that. Then they have double cream, kind of like our heavy whipping cream, but a full five to seven percent more milk fat. And then they have creme froche. Now creme froche, like for us, is like a liquefied sour cream. Uh, we actually use it like on a tomato bisque. You see that little swirl that's on floor and all. Here it's roughly around 35% milk fat. Over there it's a minimum of 55%. And so one of the reasons why you want to do that is because of not just the flavor for all, but also how you're complexing your whole dish together, right? If you're, you have to think of creating every kind of dish as kind of like um, building a structure, right? Building it up. If you're uh, build, cooking it with like 1%, 2%, if you were to use it, which I will never do, um, that would be like building a little straw hat if you're going to be on a, out in Tahiti or something like that. So if you got more complex, a lot of different flavors going on, different things, then you want to construct it more like as if you're building um, a rock or a brick house where I live in Colorado, you want something to be cold and contain everything. So it's just a good analogy. So I've added the cream into it. I'm going to show you right now. Here's our, the basis of our pumpkin soup. And I'm going to puree this here in just a moment. That's good. That's good. Now, you, now, when we call it puree, you can do this any which way. You can do it a lot, you can do it a little.
but I would suggest you use one of these. This is an immerser. be closer to uh, the table cream or single cream for it all maybe even a little less so so here's the thing even though it says heavy cream who you buy the heavy cream from depends right uh, some of the Costco's here not all of them in Southern California and none of them in Nevada where I do but you can buy it online from Costco it's a dollar more that's it. Darcy's 40% um, of the fat it's an amazing if, I'm, if this was what I was doing for the catering job, I'd be using that. It's just over the top for everything. So this is called an immersing stick. Sometimes in a restaurant we have big industrial ones like this. But for you, this is like a $30 product. And it purees everything. It's a lot easier than how you used to do. I've done this as well. Put it in your mixer. Turn it on, but you didn't put the lid on quite well enough. So it sprayed off. Everybody has going in. Everybody's, yeah. We've all done this stuff. Everybody's really trying to put it back in or whatever. You got half the soup on the counter for it all. Yeah. Much easier to do. And this will puree all my potatoes as well. And like I said, I'm just doing little bits of here and there. stages. This is where I go and do okay. a lot of times it might need a little bit more salt. I try not to because I'm using a dried chicken stock that has a lot of salt. So I try to go and make it balanced out so we don't need quite as much. We're fine here. We do need a little bit more garlic. And I'm using garlic powder at this stage. And then we're also gonna take blue cheese crumbles. Now, I know not everybody's a big fan of blue cheese. I blame ranch. I love it. Blue cheese is better. And I know the inventor of ranch. He has a, he's a winer guy up in uh, the ranch is pretty in Northern California. Uh, he also invented, um, uh, he was also on Captain Crunch. He's the guy that invented the chemist for Captain Crunch and also granola bars. Oh, wow. All of that done in the 70s. So, blue cheese. We're using a mild blue cheese, or sometimes called an Amish blue cheese. That means it's a blue cheese, um, but it's only just started to age. It's not like Roford or a lot of the other ones we choose from. There are 900 different types of blue cheeses around the world. So, not all of them are really strong. I mean, Gorgonzola is a type of mild blue cheese. So, a lot of people like that. So we're going to use just half of our container of blue cheese here, right now, and the rest we're going to use as a garnishment, and then puree this. I'm looking at my bacon here, almost there. I had to turn it down for a little bit, it was cooking a little too fast. Now this isn't all going to get as super crispy, when you cut it, cut it down like that, not going to get the super to cook, but it's not going to come crispy at all. There's a lot of fallacies when we go and cook pork that we're worried about. Sausage meat can still be 100% cooked and have a little pink to it. You're not going to change some of the stuff that's in there. I've done scotch eggs where I baked it for an hour and a half, 90 minutes. It's dead. The health department says it's dead, right? And then we'll still flash fry, deep fry it for two minutes afterwards. People will still say it's not cooked enough. <laughs> it's because of they're so ingrained about the color. It has to be gray, dark brown or gray. But when you've gone to the, all those steps, you don't really have to worry about it that much. All right, our soup is done there. We got the bacon bits for the garnishment. I'll let that go right now, and I'm gonna walk around with this right here. Here is our finished pumpkin soup. All right. Finished pumpkin soup. Now, 
Sometimes I'll probably put a little bit more into the soup, unless it's a garnish. But we got all the flavors we need in us. So this recipe is found in my baking called the cookbook. Which is available next door. I'll tell you a couple other recipes that are in this Red Hot book. One of them being the front cover is a Brinkman Bacon Bunny. So it's a rabbit stuffed with kind of mashed potatoes, which is potatoes, cabbages, and onions, wrapped in a weave of bacon with a honey whiskey butter glaze to the outside. If you've done some of my other demonstrations in the past, we've also done like a sticky toffee pudding, which is a very moist date cake with a real scotch butterscotch frosting on it. You make butterscotch, butterscotch whiskey, and brown, and brown sugar in the cream. And then we top it off with candy bacon. And the best one out of here is when they take pears, cut it in half, pour it out. They fill it with a concoction mixture that's crushed graham crackers, butter, cinnamon, vanilla, spice rum, and a bit of brown sugar. Mix it all that together, make a nice little paste, stick that in there, put a dollop of goat cheese on top of it, and then wrap it up with bacon and bacon pear half, right? And people said Celtic cuisine was done on a dare. Quickly, just to tell you some of my other recipes, so I also want my soup here just to heat up and reduce down just a little bit more. Soups over there are always served piping, piping, piping hot. If it isn't piping hot, they're going to say, why are you selling me cold soup? Yes, we as Americans tend to go with light now, it's a little colder, but after living there for a while, I get to be the same way I want mine hot. They're a colder country than we are. So my Scottish cookbook was the first one I wrote. I've won awards in some Top Chef charity competitions in Denver, Dallas, and Las Vegas. Uh, here for a cockalipi soup. It's a chicken and leek soup, uh, traditional. I use a little white rice filler, but a key ingredient, the judges were coming up and asking what it was, because they didn't recognize it, was dried plums or prunes. Dried fruit is a big aspect of Celtic cuisine. They use it for savory dishes as well as bread, scones, and desserts. We also won for a roast leg of lamb and a blueberry port wine demi glaze, which we did yesterday, and a very decadent orange chocolate whiskey mousse. My Irish cook, we won for an Irish asparagus blue cheese salad, a three-time marinated Irish stew. We marinate the lamb first, onions, garlic, and butter, second in red wine, and then third in Guinness. And then a Guinness chocolate walnut cake that we did yesterday as well. My Welsh cookbook, how many people like shepherd's pie? So this tells you all the do's and don'ts how to make the proper shepherd's pie. The biggest one you need to make sure you have to have at least 50% lamb in it, because you can't shepherd cows, so you can't call it a shepherd's pie. But doing it wrong, it's just it's called a cottage pie then. But I've used the same recipe, my sister's always challenged me with different things, and she handed me three pounds of wild boar. And I went and made a cottage pie out of the wild boar. Drained a little of the excess fat on it, but it was still an amazing dish. Uh, also in here is one that we're going to be doing the next demonstration today, which is called a Queenie Salad. Queenie, they have a Queenie Festival in the Island of Man for their bay scallops. That's why the king scallops are the, are the are sea scallops, the queen scallops are the bay scallops, the smaller ones. And so this is a salad mix that has uh, queen scallops, potatoes into it, boiled eggs, and all the Dutch flavors. So if you, that's our next one at 1 o'clock. Now, I've also written a Celtic style vegetarian cook, and I actually sell more of these in Texas than any other city. There are just as many vegetarians in Texas as anywhere else, except for there, they're all in the closet. They're the ones going to their barbecues and saying, you know, I'm not feeling too much, I'm just gonna have some, you know, the vegetables, the fruit, the uh, carrots, and then celery you put out. But in here, there's a 200 year old recipe for cheesecake before the invention of cream cheese, called lemon curd cake. Uh, then you take your modern day curds or cottage cheese, break it down and sieve, and then mix in your uh, cake up from there. Uh, one we also did yesterday was a wild mushroom masala, which is several different types of mushroom boiled down in ale, or in this case, Guinness, some tomatoes, and all that made into a bruschetta. So there's some really interesting flavors in there. My last book I wrote out is the soup sauces, stocks, and stews. So there were different soups, and then the different boxes. For one of them was a smoked salmon whiskey cheese soup. We also have a cauliflower whiskey cheese soup in here, um, a leek and pumpkin seed soup. There's also a, a recipe for Guinness gravy. But one of the biggest ones is how to go and make your own stock. How many of you are watching your salt intake? 
some people are so using stocks. Some of them out there are so watered down you can't even taste the chicken or the beef in it. And the other version is you're using something that's all dry and it's got way, way too much salt. So how you control that is by um, the power line kind of goes next to my dog over here, so he kind of moved up. Um, how you take care of that is by making your own stock. Now it used to take hours and hours to make your own stock, but if you get an instant pot, you can do it all in an hour. And on my freezer door, I have these little um, Tupperware things that screw down and I hold two cups of liquid in. So I can go right there and I got all my chicken stock, all my uh, lamb stock, I can do beef stock, I can do pork stock, and can do shrimp stock. Here's the main secret about making stock, chicken stock. It's not the meat that is making your flavor, it's the bone. When, you do that, when they tell you they want to get as much meat, they really mean strip that bone all the way off. The more meat that's on the bone, the less flavor you're going to get. Then what you take the bones is then you take a little spray thing that's got olive oil in it, spray down all parts of your bone, right? Put it on a, on a tray and let it sit there for maybe 10, 15 minutes, then stick it in your oven at low temperature, like 250, 275, for two to three hours. All that oil has seeped into all the crevices of the bones, and the heat is going to go and boil off and pull out all the flavor. And it's kind of the marrow of the bone that's really where the flavor is. And you can get this amber color all over everything. That's where you're gonna get your main flavor for it. Same thing applies for pork bones, uh, oh, lamb bones, you do that stuff. Shrimp, you're using the shrimp shells. You can make lobster stock if you want to do it. Turkey stock, it's all about getting that, and baking that, and getting that is your basis for your soup. You get a best, but better flavor. And then like I said, you just go to the freezer and grab what you need, and you've got to control exactly the, uh, uh, the amount of salt on that. So, all these recipes, the books are next door, they're available, they're $20 each, or they're special for any three for 55. And also all of our spice lines, including the one we did, our corner mix spice is next door for us. And I'll be available to sign. The books are like we did, it's like half a cookbook, half a history book. So does anybody have any questions for me about public food, public cuisine, public history, or just cooking in general? Sure, because it's, yeah. Why do you use only the square knives, not the ones that go to a Well, oil I use oil. different knives for different things. Oh, okay. Some things I like. Some of those I like better for chopping. Oh, okay. Vegetables for okay. So I have butcher's knives as well, and chef's knives, and yeah, I've got a whole bag. Okay, I was just curious. I have a couple thousand dollars in knives, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else a question? Like our knives. Sorry. It was a hand that went up, but wasn't a question. All right, so I'm going to have you all come up and line up here in just a moment around the corner here. We're all going to get you a get page for all. I'd like to thank you all very much, and our next demonstration is at 1 o'clock. It was a pleasure to work with you all meeting in. From the fount of every blessing, tune my heart to you sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. My Father is omnipotent, and that you can't deny. A God of might and miracles, 
is written in the sky. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. The Bible tells us of his power and wisdom all the way through, and every little bird and flower our testimonies too. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. But now I see. We'd like you to stand again as we sing about God's amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that caught my heart.
Please be seated. If you have your tartan with you, or would like to just come up and mention the name of your clan, would you line up in the center here and come and present the name of your, uh, your clan or your tartan? And then as you conclude, if you would just turn it out to the left or to the right, we'll try to balance that out a little bit. And if you would do that for us, would you like to step forward? It'd be fun to go to the other clan, I'm sure. Clan McPherson. Huh? What? Go ahead, Donaghy. I'll let it go. Fun. House of Borden. Clan of Bruce. Clan Gunn. Clan Grant. Clan Wallace. This tartan is a commemorative of Scottish Parliament. Clan Mackenzie. Kinley. Clan Usher. Clan of McLaren. Clan McLaren. Clan Morrison and Ferguson. Anyone else? Okay. If you would stay up here for just a minute while we pray. Lord, I thank you very much for the people representing these different clans, Lord Jesus, and for the history of these clans. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blessing that these people are, Lord, whatever their sphere of influence is. We thank you for them. We thank you for your anointing on this congregation and the clans and the people that they represent. Lord, I would ask that you would lengthen the tent, the tent poles and the sphere of influence that the people of God have here today, representing each of these families, each of these clans. And they would go forward today and would bring your presence into wherever they go, whether it be their neighborhoods, whether it be their jobs, whether it be clubs that they belong to, whether it, be, it would be their clan gatherings, whether it would be just throughout the games here today. We would ask your anointing to be upon them and the families that they represent, Lord Jesus, and the people would know us by our acts and by our character and by our speech. And you would pour out your blessing on each of the families represented here. Those who did come up and mention a clan, those in the congregation and those that are here. And Lord, at the same time, we would ask your anointing and your blessing on the people back in Scotland and in the UK. We would ask, Lord, for there to be an incredible revival. I just returned from two weeks in London and everywhere we went, Lord, we prayed for revival for the UK. And so I would ask, Lord Jesus, that you would open hearts and minds. There would be a tremendous revival, especially in Scotland and all of the UK. And I thank you for those that are here today. And ask that your anointing would go with them. Your blessing, a double portion of your blessing, would be upon them. In the name, and by the authority, and by the power, and by the shed blood of Jesus. In your name, Lord, amen and amen. You can be seated.
getting a little windy here. We're near the beach where this is. And, uh, had a blast. Thanks so much for watching the video. Like and subscribe. See you guys. And also, thank you to my Patreons. You guys are the best. Have a great day in Middle Earth. And we'll see you in the next videos. See ya.